Hello to everyone who's joined us. Happy Sunday, final day of Hello. UK Games Expo. I'm Jason with Phase Shift Games here with Darren and Scott. Hi. Hey. Thanks for joining. This is our uh, final session for UK Games Expo, Virtually Expo. Uh, we wanted to just kind of relax, kick back, talk about the weekend, talk about our distant past, talk about our distant future, kind of all ends of the spectrum, and just kind of see where things are going and uh, and where we're headed. So um, let's start with, uh, I don't know, if, do I have any initial announcements? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, just a shout out to the UK Games Expo team. This was our first big kind of virtual convention, and I personally love it. We're going to talk about our feelings on everything and kind of the world and where we're at and if this virtual convention thing will will persist and continue. We'll talk more about that, but uh, definitely a shout out to the UK team for pulling off something that I think was pretty impressive. Uh, seeing their site and the inner workings and the complexities that they had to deal with uh, and what they arranged, uh, I, I think that this was, for me, as a first time virtual con experience, this was, I thought, pretty great. So I don't know, that's just, uh, wanted to give a quick thanks and shout out to that, to that team. So, Darren, we'll start with you. Um, we'll just go round robin. But what was your what was the most exciting thing for you this weekend? What what did you like seeing? Well, for me, it was like a whole bunch of different things because um, since things have been uh, stopping easy to meet in person over the last bunch of months, but we've all still been working together very tightly. Uh, even though we couldn't see Scott, it was great to physically see you again, Jason, um, <laughs> and to actually. Um, um, play with, you're the one who has a lot of the prototype stuff, to actually play the games, physically play the games. I had a blast, and I know there are our own games, and it's a little self-serving to say that, but honestly, <laughs> I had a lot of fun, because I played a lot of things for the first time, and for me, I would say the highlight, and you know what I'm going to say, is it is the um, cooperative mode of Dungeon Drop. Mm. I just, I love that. So, yeah, that's uh, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed the most. It's great connecting with people. It's always fun when we're doing that, and then you're looking over and you're seeing who's got something to say and responding to them. Just, you know, that feeling of, you know, you can still kind of feel the presence of other people, even though it's just us in the room. Yep. Scott? Uh, well, I, 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 to be honest, I would have to say a similar thing. You know, we it's in the age of, of distance right now. Uh, and even though I'm still distant from you guys, this was an extended time that we did spend together on uh, the projects, which is something that I know we all love to do. Uh, and this convention, uh, hopefully other people enjoy getting to see our stuff, but it's also like self-serving in terms of uh, <laughs> just this time to get to spend together, talking about the games we're working on, um, you know, essentially play testing them more together. Um, getting to see that work, getting to see Darren really, really crush uh, a couple of you guys in competition. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, just super thankful for the whole experience. And I would also echo, you know, the people that I've had the chance to interact with from, um, from the UK Games Expo. It's just been, been really nice and welcoming, and it's been a great... I know this is a environment that could be really stressful because everybody's doing stuff for the first time but they haven't made it feel that way it's been really uh, welcoming and this feeling like everybody's just trying to, to do their best get the best uh, we can out of it so yeah absolutely yeah. and and there could be tech all these technology challenges thankfully we didn't have many we had latency in one of our streams we had a late start in one of our streams but you know all in all you know, we spent, I don't know, 16 hours of, of stream time this weekend, and uh, it all went very well. So for me, I got to say, uh, a couple highlights, I think. So uh, all of this was a big experiment in a lot of ways. Scott, you weren't physically with Darren and I playing the games. You were in virtually watching. And at first, as we were prepping for the weekend and talking about it, I'm saying to myself, why would Scott even want to come and uh, isn't that going to be boring? But having you there as this uh, omnipresent voice from the netherworld <laughs> watching us uh, was outstanding, actually. I loved that we were playing a game, but then we had the voice of the designer kind of chiming in either to, to correct us if we missed a, a small rule or to you know point out some strategies or whatever. I 
So that coupled with one other aspect, which is our game is so um, physical and tactile and I feel like really struggles to translate to digital, um, you know, where so many other games you can play digitally, you can play physically, it doesn't really matter. For our game, that drop and the flicking and stuff, it's like, how does that translate to watching it on a screen? Um, but I feel like the two things combined just led to a recipe that actually worked. And, and I'm very optimistic for what that could mean for how we do things moving forward. I really want to get back to real conventions, no question. Yeah. But I do think in the meantime, this did afford us some interesting opportunities. Uh, and I think some stuff worked really well. I agree. Yeah. So um, just to um, catalog before I ask this next question, things that happened this weekend. We did um, we did demo plays, uh, Dar Darren and I and my daughter for a couple of them playing a game and streaming it live so people could see it and we unveiled some stuff and and played and scott you were there watching we did that quite a few times then we also had live games of dungeon drop on tabletop simulator that another guy on our um, team brad hosted uh people met him in discord and then played games and then came back and either joined our stream to learn more or vice versa they saw the stream then they wanted to play the game i saw lots of people posting on twitter and um and facebook about their experience like oh i just played this on tabletop simulator it was more fun than i thought it would be in that environment and blah 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 really cool to see that stuff so we had live games happening then we did uh, a couple streams where we were just kind of talking panel discussions questions and answers uh so there were a bunch of different things that we participated in oh and then we were on the main stage of okay. virtually expo last night um, and then all the while, we have retailers in the UK that are selling Dungeon Drop, and we participated with uh, getting, you know, getting those copies out into the wild. Uh, we offered our 20% discount, which is still active on our site. Um, so a lot of different things. Now, of everything um, that we've experienced so far, I guess, what do you guys think, what parts of a virtual convention work better um, what parts of a virtual convention maybe just don't work as well and you know unsure if you know if that's the right way to go anything like that Scott we'll start with you this time um, well I would say to me the, the trade-off so <laughs> it's it's hard to be I did have uh, effectively one in-person experience of demoing dungeon drop with you guys at a convention and and there's no question and the game, you know, uh, is best when when held and, and all the tactile nature of that comes out. People can see people playing it that way. Um, and those those interpersonal interactions are phenomenal. Uh, I think our game is one that, that just makes people stop and look at what you're doing and gets that initial attention if they're walking by in a physical hall. We don't have that in a digital hall. You know, you have to click on us to see the game versus being just browsing by and walking by and seeing this crazy thing happen and, and wanting to know more about it. But uh, the trade-off, I think, always in the digital space is people can communicate in a way they feel most comfortable. Like when you're in a when you're in an actual con, I mean, it's busy, it's hectic. You know, if I'm someone touring, maybe I have a question about a game like Dungeon Drop, but the person demoing it's talking to somebody else, they seem busy or it's loud and noisy, and I just I keep walking because it's too much trouble or whatever. Um, whereas here, there's so many ways to communicate. You know, you can be on the Discord, you can join our Discord server, you can post um, something into a chat, and, and you're going to be heard. A small team like ours, you know, but sooner or later, we're going to get back to you individually yeah. uh, about whatever you're interested in, um, in, in everybody's own time. Which doesn't happen in the craziness of a con, is this, uh, you know. Uh, so Very true. That, that's, I think, the biggest trade off to me. Yeah. I, I think for me, the um, it's it's interesting. If it's an either or, um, I, I guess I guess what it really comes down to is they're very they're really quite different. Doing what we did this weekend was in a way more relaxing. It yes. Was a bit, there were some mm -hmm. there were some technical things, but other than that, it was more it was relaxed. Um, I almost see them as two different things, and, and mm. I think that if, if when the time comes that we can do conventions again, I just see them both working in parallel. Like sometimes, yeah. you, 
like not 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 at the same event. Like you have your big events like your Gen Cons or whatever. You go to those, and then other things are like this. Um, I don't really. Right now, we're kind of forcing this to replace that. I mm. feel so much like it replaces it. I feel like it's like, well, if I can't do this, I can do that. Uh, sort of doing something, but I see them as two different things, and they're both good in their own ways, and they're different enough that I think they're both worth doing. It's just at the moment we have to consider. Hmm. It. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. Actually, that's great. Awesome. Uh, I don't have anything else to add to that, so we'll. we'll We'll call that one. Um, So five years ago, what would you have answered if folks asked you, where do you see yourself in five years? It's kind of looking back now at at where we are right now and just kind of interesting uh, retrospective, I guess. You know, five years ago, where did you see yourself with respect to game design, game publishing at least? Uh, What would you have answered five years ago? Darren? Okay. Uh, well, I've I've been making games my whole life, mostly digital games. That's my professional daytime career. Um, but I always knew I I love the being with people and the tactile nature of the games and sitting across from people. I always knew, I mean, I played D D and all those ever since I was little. That I wanted to make these. And then when I came across Game Crafter, I was able to start actually making legitimate looking. Perfect. Because I'm an artist, I was able to make them look pretty good, I believe, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, But what I also knew is uh, my two, my bosses from where I work during the day, they're, they are make a great combination pair of a, a, a team. And I always knew for board games that I am, don't have certain skills that I need to do a full-blown company. I can do maybe half of it or whatever. But I knew I needed my second half, and Jason came <laughs> along, and I I knew he was my. Se- I'm serious. I knew every time I knew he was my second half before he even knew it. I was telling him last night that I knew he could do more than he even thought he could do, hmm. and he has actually now proven it because I believe that the, our current beginning success is a large testament to Jason's ability as a. So basically, I had hoped that I would find somebody like Jason five years ago, and I have. That's where I am. Ah, well, the, the feeling's mutual there, of course, 100%. Um, what I would say five years ago, um, so I was, at that point, I had a partnership with, what was that? That was 2015. So I had a partnership with um, another guy for, a, for Geek Fever Games, basically our design firm, which is now part of Phase Shift Games. Um, and we were just designing games. We actually dabbled with Kickstarter um, somewhere around that time, maybe a year earlier or a year later, I forget, but we dabbled with doing a a Kickstarter. It was a small one, couple, actually we did two or three um, and uh, to different levels of of success, but never like a big splash like we really tried to do with with Dungeon Drop and successfully did. Um, But so where would I have seen myself five years ago? I think I was, I definitely, I was only in the geek fever mindset, which is which was trying to be a great design firm where we were designing things. We dabbled with Kickstarter, but we didn't really feel like that was our shtick. And so it was, we kind of acknowledged we're here to pitch to publishers and sign our games. And we did that quite a few times very successfully. We brought in, in 2015, uh, our third partner, uh, Tim. And so it was Matt, Tim, and I. And then uh, I think a year or two after that is when we met Darren. So at that point in my life, I was not seeing, I think in the back of my head, I knew I wanted to, I wanted to turn some business entity into something that could be truly like self-sustaining, you know, become the the full-time gig. But I I wasn't like gung ho on that's the path for Geek Fever. That's what this is destined to become. We were much more of a uh, a consortium of designers just trying to get great games out there at that point. But I I would say that I think in the back of my brain, I knew I wanted something to grow. I didn't necessarily know that that was going to be the thing uh, or didn't think that that was the thing, but I knew something was going to start brewing. So I think I saw the storm coming, as Darren said, and, and ultimately the storm was Darren and Jason teaming up. So <laughs> uh, that's what I would answer. Scott, what about you? 
Um, yeah, well, first I would just say, you know, I think uh, uh, obviously your previous experience just designing is is uh, useful all the time, you know, as you work with me and, and work with everybody else here. Um, so, you know, and all of us had that shared experience of the design perspective, which is kind of the core of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, you're able to leverage that here, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, I think part of the reason it's worked out is you guys have a lot of skills that translate um, to other parts of this business. Uh, and there, I, from my perspective, which is more, you know, just as the designer outside, although we, we collaborate on stuff, there is so much, you know, being uh, in this team has showed me just how much there is that goes into uh, starting a Kickstarter, running a Kickstarter, uh, managing the business, and you guys are very transparent with all that. But it's clear you need to find, you know, <laughs> some advice for people, you need to find a team of people that, that have these skills that can manage all those shipping contacts and all these things. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a lot. And, and then I've even seen, even though this, this team is well-resourced, there's still a lot of times where I see you guys reaching out to other people that have a lot more knowledge about, you yep. know, manufacturers or this. I mean, there's, yep. it's just a ton to it. Um, so you got to love doing it and want to get into all that. Um, now, in terms of me, I mean, five years ago, this has been kind of a crazy ride that would go back. You were just a baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was, I was still mainly, I mean, I, my roots in, in designing games you know, go back much more to when I was a kid. I was doing it all the time, or you know, even in adolescence and stuff. Um, and then, you know, I got back into the the hobby game market big time. I think that was important though. First, you know, um, just just for for a number of years, all I was doing uh, was playing all the the new modern games again and just really having fun and getting back into it and seeing what was out there and starting a little game group here and um, you know because you, you, there was a lot of, of growing up to do in terms of understanding what was going on in game design I started listening to a ton of podcasts um, you know Gabe Barrett's podcast yep. on yep. game design um, but obviously Dice Tower and all these things and again just, just I started just wanting to absorb all of that and of course the more I listened to there's Gabe Barrett's I, book right there <laughs> yeah um, but the more I listened to you know the wheels just start turning inevitably slowly like at first it was like starting to think about designing myself it was just like a distant little thought and then it gets more and more real again um, the more the more I'm doing it and um, and then you know uh, yeah all of a sudden I mean the game crafter I, I, I a huge shout out to them I think like Darren so many uh, so many people have been given an avenue through the game crafter because the knowledge that I could make a game that I was making at home look semi-professional yeah just that that possibility out there even if it never happens right it's a huge motivator yeah to just finish it right and uh the contests too are a huge motivator but i don't yeah just that having that out there once i really explored the game crafter i, I think that was kind of the final piece of the puzzle it's like i want to do this now and um you know then i started to really dive in again now the journey from there to here again is is uh, not one I could have predicted, but obviously it's yeah. kind of the, the absolute dream of what could have happened is uh, is where we are. So, you know, keep going. Uh, if you're out <laughs> there and want to design stuff, uh, luckily we live in this amazing, yeah. you know, the Game Crafter Kickstarter, we, we live in a world where you can have small companies success, small yeah. level success. I mean, you can always hope it gets better and better, but it's, it's a very open world, and the, and the board game community is a really open one. A lot of possibilities. Oh, another huge thing um, is joining up uh, a game design group if you have one in yeah. your area, um, which uh, there's a big one. Boston um, has a game design group um, that I'm not going to anymore, but uh, I was for a while, and that was big. Um, so anyway, yeah. So just to maybe piggyback a little bit on something, a couple things you said, if I rewind even further, um, uh, so during my college years, uh, Matt, who I started Geek Fever Games with, 
he and I were designing games back then, which is many decades ago. I won't tell you all how many. <laughs> at least two. Uh, and basically what we were doing at the time turned into a, a, a very successful tax write-off uh, and nothing more. But that's because in that day and age, I mean, heck, we were on bulletin board systems and maybe Prodigy at that point or the earlier years of AOL. Uh, so, I mean, the notion of internet platforms and e-commerce and, uh, and software as a service, you know, tools that we can use, Kickstarter was not even a, a glimmer of a thought. Um, so then fast forward, 2012, when we started Geek Fever, it was basically, I saw Matt had published a book, he had, he's an author as well, and my father either had just published a book or was, was in the process of publishing a book. And I said, you talk about a motivator. I was like, I can do a game. Because at that point, it was like Kickstarter was a reality. The Game Crafter, who we talk about a lot. And just for folks in the UK who are watching, you may not be familiar. They're a, they're a big platform, uh, uh, software platform here in America um, where it's, it's print on demand. You basically... Uh, you upload all your digital assets for the cards and the boards and um, whatever else you have in your game. You identify dice that you need and cubes and whatever. You upload artwork for a box and basically hit a button and in two days you get shipped in the mail a box, a professional box that's shrunk wrapped with all your stuff inside. I mean, you make a game and self-publish it. And then you can even publish it on their site in their storefront and, uh, and and it can sell and you can make profit that way as well. So and, and they have a whole spectrum of other services, which is awesome. So I was seeing all these tools, plus the conventions, the Boston Festival of Indie Games, and um, I was working with Ad Magic in some of those earlier years as well. They're another print service uh, uh, publisher of smaller games. Um, and so they're a printer, but then they have a publishing arm as well. Anyway, uh, I just said to Matt, we can do this we can actually like what we tried to do 20 years prior was ill-conceived and we we're talking to local uh machine shops to give us a quote to manufacture our obnoxiously large and complex game uh it was um yeah just a different day and age so the motivation though uh to your point scott definitely there when you see some of these successes <clears throat> anything else to add darren or yeah that's all good yeah so then, what are you most excited about for next year, over the next 12 months, Scott? Well, uh, the <laughs> I mean, this might be an easy answer. More exciting for me. I mean, this is, uh, there are two, two projects. I mean, uh, again, talking about the living the dream, this is uh, you know, not just one, but two projects that are on the horizon. Um, you know the near horizon being the the expansion that we're we're working on um, to Dungeon Drop and then uh, Drop Drive continuing to evolve and eventually be released um, in 2021. So, I mean the near term is uh, incredibly exciting, and uh, of course <laughs> it'll get nerve wracking again. You know, uh, as much as we'd like to believe you know previous success will lead to future success mm -hmm. like we're just having our kickstarter talk and all the lessons learned and things but it's still you know it's still a uh, uh, unpredictable environment now uh, kickstarter i mean that's the excitement of the whole thing and like we couldn't have predicted our success uh to the level that we had right uh so it is it's but we see, you know, I, I watch Kickstarter all the time. I backed, I just backed, uh, Port just came in the map, for example. <laughs> um, and uh, you see projects that look good not get to where we got, you know, and you're always one I, I sometimes I just sit and I browse it for a while. It's just like, why? Why didn't this yeah. work, you know? Um, yeah. Because it looks good. <laughs> Yeah. And and of course sometimes that just puts this little pit in your stomach like oh well our future projects work because um, if this project that looks really good could could have could struggle then any project could struggle um, yep. so it's um, you know it's nerve wracking but again that's that's the excitement of this whole thing and uh, so I just you know I've got like that classic nervous excitement about these next couple of projects but I wouldn't ask for it any other way this is is why we do it so it's great yeah darren it's 
same, same thing here though. I mean, the next couple of projects we have our expansion, uh, drop drive I'm really excited about and just other ways of, of pushing our current games forward, other games we have in the works. Uh, like you have your game, you kind of touched on a little bit that your your design, uh, Jason, that um, you know at some point we'll start talking more about. So there's just a lot of a lot of excitement. In it. Also, just building up our community. Um, that's one of the things we really like doing. It's like you like interacting with other communities. That's one of the fun parts of doing the Kickstarter. Is actually you know hearing almost like not almost in fact literally in real time what the people are thinking about our campaign and we are responding to it. Sometimes we actually even do something different or make something new based on what's going on with that. So that kind of excitement is is all there as well. So um, I'm the kind of person that, like, when I watch a movie, for example, I always love watching the making of part, sometimes even more than a movie, because mm. I love the creative process. I love collaboration and the creative process. And that's why I love working with you two guys, because the, the, the three heads together working on different things. Um, and it's good that we don't always agree on every single thing, because that's why we have all three of us. So, but between between the three of us, we always get to where we need to get to. And I'm very excited about just that that whole process. And we each have a different skill set with a bit of with Venn diagram. We have a good yeah, solid right. core, but then we have our own individual skill sets that complement each other really well. So I think we're we're a good tripod in these next couple of projects coming up. Yeah. I'll um I'll echo a little bit of what Scott said. Obviously, I'm very excited about all the same things, but the terrified, you know, a little bit terrified of some things. I think it is very important for us to be humble, and I know Darren and I especially, uh, that's who we are by nature. Um, while we had a, a clear success the first time around, I don't want to just assume that. Oh no. That. We got this in the bag, you know. No, there's still a lot of hard work on the horizon. Darren and I, after yesterday's um, long set of uh, uh, live streams, we went out for a drink, and we just were sitting and, and looking at the date. Uh, here we are at August 23rd, and October 6th is our uh, is our next Kickstarter. Realistically, there's just one month in between those two dates, and in that one month, we got a lot of work to do still uh, to do it right. Uh, a lot of advertising, a lot of marketing, prototypes, getting out to, to testers and previewers and intro video. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I am still feeling that pressure. Uh, don't want to take anything for granted. The other thing uh, that terrifies me a little bit is um, back in February when COVID hit us, you know, and, and, and our life changed irreparably from that point forward. Um, a lot of publishers did what we did, and they said, we're going to hold on Kickstarter for now. We're not, like, people are hunkered down at home, people are losing their jobs, there's not going to be a lot of Kickstarter activity, and a lot of us pulled back. We definitely did, consciously, on our part. Um, it turns out, Kickstarter actually became more popular during that time. Uh, and because there were less projects, because many publishers pulled back, uh, those projects that were there did way better. <laughs> they had way more, like there were just fewer projects to, to spread the, the dollars, you know, amongst. So it's interesting in hindsight. And my fear is, you know, October 6th is our date. We're not the only ones launching that day. Uh, a lot of publishers who held are now looking at the fall as like, okay, we got to get back into it. And we're not the only ones. So again, all we can yep. do is hope that we have done right by our, our audience, our fans, uh, the, keep keep to the spirit of this game and what makes it special. Uh, do our due diligence in terms of marketing and and advertising and reviews and and all that uh, jazz. And we're just gonna have to see what happens. <laughs> but it is a little yeah. terrifying. Yeah, I, I definitely second that. Like when we talk about our success, what we what we mean is we had a successful first product. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not meaning like yeah we made it. No, we just no. this is our first step forward was a solid one but we know that the next is going to keep doing it we, we're just going to keep working at it and doing our best to make the games our, our fans want to play yeah also i would jump in i misspoke before fort was a pre-order not oh. a kickstarter okay uh, so the kickstarter i'm awaiting to play with my kids is unicorn fever which has been one that i think got um because of where it was coming from i'm pretty sure they've had some tough shipping delays with uh, COVID and everything, <laughs> which we just avoided, I know, with our, our product for most most countries. So should we uh, should we enumerate 
how many Kickstarters we're each waiting on because I've got yeah. about a lot. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not even sure. I did, I did back something pretty recent. I like, I like RPGs also. I don't, I never played them, but I just love, I love reading them and having the books and them, reading through the lore and how they translate mechanics. I, I just, I, I, I'm actually one of those persons that actually likes reading the rule book. Mm-hmm. 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 I do too. Um, uh, especially, I know you and I, Darren, talk a lot about like 40k back back to our Warhammer days. Uh, and for some reason, as obnoxiously large and complex as those rule books are, yeah, there's just they do a good job of making it like it's part of the experience. Is is reading through and and under- And for me, I always my favorite army was the Tyranids, and they and they always pour so much customization into the Tyranids, right down to you can. In the latest ones, you know, you're you're deciding the core genus uh, for for the alien creature, and then what kind of arms and legs and antennas and everything else. Like you can literally design these aliens from ground up, and it's just part of the. It's crazy complex, but part of the fun. <laughs> yep. No, I, I sometimes I catch myself having one of the types of conversations with a friend that you are right now, and it, it really strikes me as interesting. We're probably the first kind of real generation to grow up and be old enough now to kind of like reminisce like uh, you know go out the friend and reminisce and sometimes we, we are reminiscing in a very like grand way about a game that we used to play as a kid you know that you know yeah whether it's like yeah the early days of magic cards and, and, and staying up all night having all pooled in our money for a box of cards and having like this big opening party yeah, yep <laughs> for, uh, some classic you know video games we used to play together as kids but we're talking about it in the same way i watched you know my dad or my grandfather talk about like key huge things in their growing up experience but now games have become part of that you know uh and I think the board game culture in our modern era has become rich enough now, diverse enough now, that it has a chance to, to make these types of um, memories for people, which is pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, uh, so let's go down that Kickstarter route just a little bit, really quick. Let's. Uh, what What is your so eliminate any games that we've worked on ourselves, designed, published, whatever. So, what What's your favorite game to play? You know, at least lately however however you are playing games um maybe even before covid like what's what's your latest favorite game that you really enjoy playing and what is your most anticipated kickstarter that you are waiting for to come in darren why don't you start if you can yeah that's that's the tough one um because even because with a lot of this stuff it's even been hard to find time to do that yeah i did just get um star wars rebellion and I haven't uh, yeah. played it yet, but I did spend the time to set it up. So my whole, I had a whole table downstairs set up, uh, just waiting to play with my son, Rylan. Part of the problem is, uh, even if I have time, my son is so busy yep. uh, with all the different things he's doing. Even though, even with the whole Rona thing going on, uh, he's still got a lot of things going on himself. And uh, But that's one of the ones I'm really looking forward to playing that with him. Um, did, you, did you also tell me you got... Um Outer Rim, Star Wars Outer Rim, or or just yes. Rebellion? I did. I got Outer Rim, and that I played solo, and I did enjoy it. But I want to play it with somebody else as well. Yeah. But that was something that I, um, that was a, kind of in the beginning. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed that. I, I like that kind of game in, in general. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, Kickstarters coming up, like I said, I think there's a couple of RPGs. I'm sorry, the name is actually escaping me at the That's moment. Right. But there's a couple of RPGs. That had some interesting settings that I was uh, excited about, and I, I got some of those. So that's that's I think what I'm mostly waiting on in the mail. But those aren't coming out until I think yeah. next year, I think. So you know, for me, I had to, I've had to do so much shifting. You know, I had a, a small group of friends around here that that we had a little game group. Um, that's been interrupted. Um, so my you know, immediate attention like this summer has gone so much more to, to games I could play with my kids, which is just, it's a different, I mean, it's good, and we have some, you know, like Fireball Island, we'll break out mm. have a ton of fun with, or um, uh, we're playing First Sale, is one of my favorite games with all age groups. I love the game for Sale. If you have not played First Sale, it's a small card game, little real estate game. It is 
such a brilliant little design. It's a game. One thing I love it in that is a very rare thing in games is a game that exists in two halves. It's a short game, but there's like a first half that's different than the second half of the game. Mm. Uh, so the first half you, you essentially acquire your hand, and then the second half you sell it off. Mm. Uh, but it's so simple and uh, a ton of good player interaction. Uh, and uh, but. You know, out there on the horizon, uh, you know, I'm obviously hoping things change eventually, and uh, you know, I've got some some of my favorites to just get back to playing with. With <laughs> once I get adults back in the room, it's like um, can't wait for that. Yeah, uh, is one of my absolute favorites. Yeah. Um, bit of culture, mm. um, couple of favorites. Uh, Automania is an undersung game. It is a great little game if you'd like. Games like Suburbia and Viticulture, hmm. Automania is a fantastic game. You build cars, um, but it's got a couple of awesome hooks to it. One, you, your player board is like a little, it's a small factory. It's just got a, a, a little overlapping of conveyor belts. So it's one of those games where you, you acquire parts, and, and when you produce like a compact car, you, it, it like shoots out along the uh, conveyor belt and picks up all the parts that, that are along that path. And then it's got this great thing where you put your, your cars onto boats. You can make cheap, crappy cars or really souped up cars and sell them in either the European or the American market. And there's a great, there's a surprising amount of great uh, table talk about like, ah, I just made a bunch of these like crappy cars, but nobody's competing with me and I'm just selling these things off to anybody will take them um, versus creating this like Uber car that everybody wants. It's, it's fun. Um, uh, one that I'm not sure is Kickstarter, but it's probably at the top of my list. I'm just super interested in right now. It's, I think, an AEG coming title. Uh, it's, I don't know how to say it. Cubitas or Cube, Cube. I don't know if you've seen this. Cube. No. Edo, something like that. Um, I should look it up. But it's, it's like a race game where you acquire dice that are like little characters. I don't know. But it, hmm. it looks it looks really different, really interesting. Um, I've been waiting to hear more about them. I do have AEG's. Um, I just kickstarted their new pirate game. Oh, that big one. Yeah, it's a bigger one. It's actually bigger than I I expected just from at first watching the the online previews. But yeah, it is a it is a deeper game, which is cool. Uh, but it's. It's got a drop mechanic, which I thought was wicked cool. You drop these, uh, like, to, to resolve battle, you drop some components into the pirate ship, and then they flow out underneath the pirate ship on this board, and where they land, uh, you know, determines some things. And I just thought that was a novel use of, of what we obviously love with the drop mechanic. Uh, let's see, for me, uh, I was really loving... So I... I love 4X games. Uh, it, it explore, expand, exploit, exterminate, right? And there's games like, I mean, that's what Twilight Imperium is. Zaya is one that I love, uh, or Zia, uh, X-I-A, however you pronounce it. Um, uh, Star Wars Outer Rim is, it's more contained, uh, but certainly along those lines where you... You're just you're kind of like a privateer, and you can go any way you want, and 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 do things in many different ways. You could pursue mining or pirating or bounty hunting or merchanting or whatever. Uh, I love games like that. I, I like that sandbox feel. Uh, for a long time, I liked Firefly, the board game. The problem with Firefly was the fittiness with their navigation. Just drawing a card every space you move started to wear on us. We're like, eh. But um, most recently. Um, where was I going with this 4X thing? Um, oh, Z so Zaya was one that we were playing a lot of. But Star Wars Outer Rim, um, I think may re may replace my top slot, my top favorite slot, if Fantasy Flight releases expansion content for it. It is a it is unbelievable game, but it's pretty limited in the cards uh, and the content that came in the box. And this was kind of a known thing, and they announced that they had a lot of things planned for that game, and then the virus hit, uh, and they had to really limit their projects. Uh, and we were hoping to see something come out, some announcement about what's next for Outer Rim at Gen Con Virtual, and there was no announcement. So I, a lot of us are afraid that maybe it didn't quite do as well, and may maybe at the end of the line, but I hope not. Anyway, that was my favorite game that we were playing. 
uh, as far as Kickstarters, uh, I mean, I've got Dice Throne, uh, what is it called? Adventures, I think. The one where it's a cooperative against the, uh, you know, you have this map now and you're moving your, your, your party on a map, but you're all playing cooperatively. Uh, really looking forward to that. I mentioned the AEG one, but I think the one that I'm most excited about is it's called Vampire Chapters. Um, now this is in the uh, uh, the Vampire the Masquerade universe, which uh, so Darren, you know, you like a lot of the role playing. You know about the role playing game, right? From White Wolf yeah. um, or whoever owns it now, but. Uh, I love that universe with the different clans of vampires, the Terador and the Vantru and um, uh, Tremere and so on. Uh, so there's been very few games that have been in that universe. Uh, the one that I used to play back in the day was a collectible card game called, uh, it was originally called Jihad, then they changed it to Vampire the Eternal Struggle. In any case, this is a game that's kind of like Gloomhaven. It's at that level of... Um, a uh, what's the word for it? A uh, chapter, not a chapter game, but yeah, you know, just a heavy story-oriented um, game. I don't think it's legacy in that aspect, but uh, looking forward to that. It's it's in that universe, and um, looking forward to playing as these different clans of vampires and discovering new ones. So anyway, yeah, I looked at a couple of games that I did back that I'm looking forward to. Uh, one is Space Kids RPG, it's a, a yeah. small little project. Something about it just kind of, again, thinking of doing some RPG stuff with, uh, with my uh, younger son. And then another one, um, I love retro sci-fi stuff. Yeah. So this one thing called Pulp Invasion, it's like, the, it look, it's basically, it looks like it's using a lot of old retro uh, magazine cover art for what it's doing. And so I just, I backed that as well, just because I was really uh, brought in by the, by the theme and the, the artwork. So those, those are a couple nice. of Nice. Yeah, I think uh, you know Jason's most anticipated game here is this this dark vampire game, yeah. and I'm sitting here waiting for Unicorn Fever. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I think this is really good. You know, we have we're interested in a lot of different types of things. It, it leads to the reason why we have I think a lot of interesting discussions about you know um, where to go with, with different projects, and we all come at things from a different place, but we reach some I think some really great compromises. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I'll keep, keep at it. Yeah. What's next? Well, I, I, I just looked at my back projects list. The other two on my recent five were uh, the Spirits of the Forest expansion. So our good friend Gonzalo from Thundergriff. Spirits yeah. of the Forest is actually my favorite game that he's released, although I have Ten Garden upstairs that I haven't played yet. Uh, but Spirits of the Forest, the expansion, adds a co-op mode for that. And, it, you know, Darren, I talk so much about how I generally don't like co-op modes, but... What did I just say? Dice Throne Adventures is adding co-op and Spirits of the... Maybe I like co-op better than I, I give credit for. Yeah, uh, I think it, what it is is you just didn't like a certain kind of co-op. You know, that may yeah. be. It may well, be... For all, people are getting better at designing co-op. I, think, I yeah. think the flaws with co-op are becoming really clear to designers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully we, we learn from these lessons as well. Um, you know, and... Uh, that people are going in some new directions with it. You know, I think like anything else, it can be done well, but it has to be done very carefully. Yeah, that may be. Well, uh, Dungeon Drop, the co-op, I mean, I, I, it's up there in my favorites of co-op, really, because it's so, it, it marries, because the gameplay itself is so unique, the way you interact, um, and that there's like both a tactical in terms of the cards and a physical, like, I can't collect anything this, uh, my turn, and we're choosing who goes when, but you're going next, and if I can click this item into this room, then it makes that room satisfy something, but I can't get it, but you can, so I'm going to flick, mm. you know, whatever, the, the, the blue gem into that room, so that you can collect a room that has three blue gems in it, and it just has this really, really cool feeling about it. Yeah. And often, um, you know, we... <laughs> go to great pains sometimes to clarify that our game is not a heavy dexterity game. Uh, right. which, uh, however, the little kind of fun touch of dexterity that Dungeon Drop does have lends itself to co-op nicely. Because right. even if someone is kind of 
you know, alpha gaming a little bit, you know, in terms of the plan or, oh, maybe you should do this, you're the one that flips that blue cube. Uh, they can't do that for you. And therefore, you know, because in, even in a game like Pandemic, which I love, but because it's just moving your piece, you know, to a different space, anyone could technically do that. You know, the alpha gamer could. Yeah. Yep. You know, so sometimes it feels kind of like, oh, I'm just doing the thing they told me to do. But if you have to flick a cube or something, then you you have to rely on each other a little bit. Uh, so I think that is actually one of the, mm. the nicer overlaps, the little bit of dexterity into co-op. And even if you remove the dexterity elements, which is an option that we have sure. in the rule book, there is always still the exploration, which is dropping new cubes yep. on the table, which scatter existing cubes. Yep. And yep. so there is an unpredictable nature of it that doesn't exist in, in other games. Uh, I think that's a... So we have a comment on our uh, on our stream chat from Nico Silver Lightning, who I believe is our contest winner for the Trials and Tools expansion that we just uh, unveiled yesterday. Uh, he says you should try Tainted Grail from Awaken Realms, co-op adventure game that I'm currently playing with two friends once a week. Really impressive. Uh, certainly heard of um, of that game, but I have not had the, the pleasure myself yet. Okay. I as well. So, um, okay, so then the longer term future, uh, where do you see yourself or where are things at five years from now? Darren. Well, I mean, as we were discussing yesterday, we kind of have this plan that's kind of rolling out before us. I mean, we have the first game, and then people like it, so we're going to make some expansions. We have another game, if people like it, probably going to be some expansions <laughs> for that, too. It's quite likely. We have the bigger game that you're making. Um, I have some of my own designs, which may or may not ultimately be uh, phase shift design, but I also have some of my own stuff that I'm I'm uh, uh, working on as uh, at a design level. Um, but ultimately, the building phase shift as a company, uh, which we're in agreement with Jason in terms of we're not just like a series of products, but we're building a company. We're building processes. We're building relationships. We're building. Um, uh, a following of people that like what we're doing. So that's, I think, the thing that's really most exciting to me is is kind of seeing our trajectory and it, it's going in a, a direction that I'm happy with and I'm just looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to being, I mean, I'm happy being right where I am right now and I'm looking forward to where we're heading. Scott? Um... Well, I uh, five years from now, I uh, I obviously I'll start by just saying I, I hope that um, I'm still working with you guys in some capacity. <laughs> we, uh, us too. I think it's been yeah. it's been uh, a very fun collaborative experience, uh, and you know uh, I have no idea. In five years, things have changed so much just in the last few years. I have no idea where we'll be then. But uh, I imagine that we'll certainly be in touch, and we'll we'll be uh, hopefully we'll be working on something. Um, you know, there I could, you know, obviously I'll be pursue. I'll still jump back in. I'm waiting for the Game Crafters next uh, mm. contest. <laughs> Give me something to uh, to do outside as well. Um, I've got some other projects I'm always working on, um, and. Uh, I even have one. I have one project that someday maybe I'll be showing you guys that you don't know about. But uh, it's still a little ways <laughs> off. Um, and uh, gosh, yeah. I mean, five years. I honestly, I just, I, I hope to, to still be doing this in some capacity. I will honestly say that, uh, you know, it's, it's been such an enjoyable part of my life for these last few years that. Uh, and yeah, I just hope to be to be part of it. And I know that it may shift at, at some point, you know, um, where either I'm working with a slightly different team or something like that. But for now, I just hope that uh, that this continues. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, for for me, it's going to sound similar to to Darren. What you said, 
Uh, maybe my answer back when we started Geek Fever Games would have been very different. My dream then was to, you know, have my name on a box, on a shelf, right? And, and design and launch successfully a, a game. And that game was Mars vs. Earth, and we did that. And then, uh, then it was Dead Man's Doubloons, which was picked up by a, a big publisher, uh, Thundergriff, and, um, you know, and then a series of other games. So, um, those kind of wins have happened, but right now, or, or when we started Phase Shift, it was not the dream of seeing any particular game reach any particular level. It was, I want to build a very successful publishing company and, uh, and grow a company. And i um, really happy that we seem to be on a trajectory where that's, that's viable here. So, yeah. uh, Scott, you mentioned some of your other projects. I know I played another one of your prototypes uh, that you made specifically for the Rona, uh, toilet Paper Panic. That was that was a lot of fun. Uh, very niche in terms of like you know it was timely. Uh, so I don't know if you plan to do anything with that post Rona. Well, I, I saw one. Uh, somebody launched a Kickstarter immediately in that vein, and, yeah. and I know had some success with it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's not, not the way <laughs> I typically go about things. Much slower. <laughs> and then what about your other one? Uh, was it Castle Crawl or, or something along those lines? Yeah, you know, I, uh, you know, pretty much every time there's a, a contest that comes out on Game Crafter, I design something for it, whether I end up loving it or not. That was a cooperative um, uh, game that was kind of, um, I was trying to mix, you know, the mind that came out a little while yep. ago is, uh, is such a novel experience. Um, Good way to put it. By it a bit, sort of. You know, um, what if you kind of took this, trying to read your your partner's minds a little bit, uh, but in a in a space where you had more specific actions you're trying to take. That if you if you both did the same thing at the same time, it was really good for this very particular place that you were, you know, in the dungeon or whatever. Um, but you got to be honest. This is like this is like. A, uh, Another design advice I would give to people is you got to know like when the project's working and when it needs to be shelved for a bit. Um, you know, I have seen people that I you know that I work with get stuck on a design that's not working for too long. Um, you know, and uh, I, I firmly believe you know if you reach a point with a couple of you know what happened is I had a play test or two where. That I'm always looking for that that little spark of fun on the face of a playtester. Those those moments. It's been said a few times now. I totally agree um, that you're looking for almost more for facial expressions than what's happening in the game when you playtest. And you know, I went through a couple of playtests that that those facial expressions I was looking for of kind of understanding and uh, fun weren't quite there. Mm -hmm. And that to yep. me is like, nope, it's shelled at time for a bit. Um, yep. And to move on to other things, I was just having fun revising uh, Tin Architect, which mm -hmm. is a little game that I made uh, that got a, a ways in uh, the Mint Tin contest on, on Game Crafter. Um, so I've been making a, uh, a little fancier version of it still in a tin. Who knows? We'll see where that goes someday. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, nice, awesome. Any uh, any parting parting wishes or, or words for the folks, fine folks from the UK Games Expo? Uh, I just had a, a great time this weekend. It rejuvenates just being with you again, Jason, in person, and mm -hmm. talking with Scott again, and just um, not that I was ever uh, low on energy, but uh, it just uh, it's another. Another rev up for what we what we have coming ahead of us for the next couple of months. So I'm very excited and very happy to be a part of this convention. Well, I hope it wasn't just because of that obnoxious score you got in Drop Drive. That was no, we're, that's what it was. No, we're going to rebalance yeah. that game, and that shouldn't have happened. <laughs> Jason is already trying to. By the way, everyone, Jason's already yeah. trying to change the rules of the game. <laughs> To take down Baron's score. He did. He retroactively <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. He diminished some of my cards from yesterday. <laughs> I have my score. And I still want them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. So I'm actually not very 
All right. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone who's been watching us and, and following along for the weekend, chiming in with comments, trying out our games. Um, reminder that if you like what you saw with Dungeon Drop, you can get a copy of Dungeon Drop. There's four participating retailers, and you can find those links to those retailers on our virtual booth page at your uh, Virtually Expo. Um, we also have a 20% discount that we will continue for just a couple days, so it'll end pretty soon, uh, but it's a, it was a show special. So on our site, faceshipgames.com, uh, all of our different add-ons are available. There's mini expansions, there's walls and mats, and all those fun things for Dungeon Drop if you want to get any of those. Uh, and we have now warehouses in, uh, in both the U.S. and in the European Union, in Germany. Uh, so we have good distribution uh, capability. Any of those are available at 20% off. Just put the coupon code in virtually expo, all one word. Uh, and so with that, from Face Shift Games, want to thank you all again. Thank you to the UK Games Expo team. You did a great job. We had a blast. We're definitely going to be watching for more of these types of opportunities. We might do some on our own. We might participate in other cons. We'll see. Uh, but uh, this was definitely a successful experiment as far as I'm concerned. This was, for us, this was an experiment, and, and it was great. So, uh, Jason, thank you. And thank you, Darren, and thank you, Scott. Have a good day, everyone. Cheers, all.